Subscribe our channel and press bell icon to get the notification of new video. Like this video. Join our WhatsApp group to get daily latest updates. It's totally free. Part 1 you will hear a conversation between a guest and the receptionist at a hotel. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 5. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 5. Good afternoon. My name is Kelvin Jones. I booked by internet yesterday. Good afternoon, Mr. Jones. Welcome to the Armitage Hotel. Can you spell your first name for me, please? Certainly. K-E-L-V-I-N. Thank you. Do you have your booking number? Or perhaps you printed out your confirmation? Yes, of course. I don't have the printout, but I did remember to note down the number. It's 00 L two three eight one four two zero. Thanks. 00 L two three eight one four two zero. Oh, I see you've stayed with us before. Yes, on several occasions. And do you still have the same vehicle registration number, HQW5919? Well, no. This time I have the company car. And what is the registration number? Oh, dear, I can't remember. Hang on a minute. Here it is on the key ring. HUV3331. Thanks. HUV3331. Now, today is the 21st of May, and I see you've booked a deluxe room on the fifth floor, room 501. Really? I booked a deluxe room? I usually only ever have a standard double room. It's the off-season, Mr. Jones, and we've upgraded you. How nice. And what does the deluxe room have? Is it as good as a suite? Almost. It has all the usual plus a spa bath, fully stocked bar fridge, a king-size bed, and a balcony. Is there a view from the balcony? Yes. Is that a view of the bay? Yes, and a glimpse of the Blue Lagoon as well. Very nice. I hope it'll be warm enough to sit out there. We can't guarantee the weather, Mr. Jones, although we do try to make your stay as comfortable as possible. Thank you. Now that you mention comfort, is it possible to have some extra pillows, please? I have a sore shoulder, you see, and I need to prop it up at night, or I don't get any sleep. Well, you'll find pillows on the bed, of course, and we can send up a couple more later. Well, I'd appreciate that. One more thing. You paid my credit card over the Internet. Can I see your credit card, please? Oh, of course. And some photo ID? What would you like? Driver's license? Yes, that's fine. You're staying for five days, is that right? That was the original plan, yes. But the conference has been cut short by two days because the keynote speaker is ill. So I'll be going home on Wednesday. So that's just three nights in all? Afraid so. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 6 to 10.
Now listen and answer questions six to ten. Is there anything else I can help you with? Actually, there is. The conference is in a building called Chancery Chambers, but I don't have any idea how to get there. Oh, that's the funny-shaped building on the corner of King and Richard Streets. It's quite straightforward, really, and only a few minutes' walk. Look, I'll show you on this map. Good, a map. I like to follow a map if possible. Right. Well, step out the front entrance of the hotel, and you're on Hop Street. Head south on Hop Street towards Gorse Lane, and take the second on the left onto Vicar's Street West. Go all the way down the hill past the Mexican Cafe on your left, the Rebel Hostel on your right, and the big church on the corner of Allen Street. Oh, I think I know the one. It has a huge steeple. Yes, you're right. When you get to the bottom of the hill, you'll have to cross over the main street. What's the name of the main street? Mill Street. Mill Street. Ah, yes, there it is. Cross the main street and continue on to Vicar Street East. There's a big bank next to a bookshop on the corner. Go up the hill towards the entrance to the park. I've heard it's very beautiful. Oh yes, well worth a look when you've got some free time. Anyway, don't go in the park. Turn left into Kitchen Street. You'll walk past Bowen's Bistro. Actually, probably the best place to get a good lunch at a reasonable price. After Bowen's, take the second left into Baker's Lane. It's a very short street. Then take the first on your left onto King Street, and you should see the Art Deco Chancery Chambers building a bit further along. On the corner of Richard Street. Oh, thank you for that. I'm most grateful. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part two. Part two. You will hear a recorded message by an employee of an investment society giving information about savings and investment options. First, you have some time to look at questions eleven to thirteen. Listen carefully and answer questions eleven to thirteen. Welcome to the information line of the State Investment Society. Why would you choose to put your money into an investment society and not a bank? Well, SIS offers everything you'd expect from a bank, but the difference is we're a cooperative. We're one hundred percent owned by our customers, people like you. And that means we always put your best interests first. You won't see our profits going into large foreign-owned finance corporations. No, you'll see them coming back to you and your local community. As a cooperative, we work hard to keep our fees competitive and absolutely minimal. Even better, we can advise you about ways to avoid fees. Here are some suggestions. Firstly. We recommend you carry out as much of your personal banking as possible with us. We won't charge account fees unless your account becomes inactive for some reason. See, no unnecessary fees. Secondly, if you maintain certain minimum account balances, you won't have to pay any transaction charges for transferring money between any accounts that have the same customer number. 
although there may be some service charges that apply, such as the establishment of automatic payments. So, how can we help you? Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 14 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 14 to 20. Let's look first at savings options. We can give you three options. Our internet account earns you interest from your very first dollar deposited. You don't have to maintain a minimum balance and you earn a good interest rate from the start. Interest calculated daily and paid into your account monthly. You always have immediate access to your money by using the internet, text or telephone banking. What's more, there are no account or transaction fees. With our Stairs Saver scheme, the more you save, the higher interest you earn. Again, there's no minimum balance, but as your balance grows, you'll earn higher interest rates. There are three interest tiers or steps plus bonus interest. Interest is calculated daily and paid monthly. Now, what about access to your money? You are free to make as many withdrawals as you like. But if you restrict them to one a month and your balance increases over that month, then you'll earn that bonus interest. With our simple saver scheme, access is available anytime and we don't impose penalties for withdrawals. This scheme has one interest rate no minimum balance, and interest is calculated daily and paid annually at the end of the financial year, the 30th of June. So, you can see that savings accounts are ideal if you're starting from scratch. Do you know you can open a savings account with as little as $10? They're usually the best choice for short-term financial goals. For the longer term, we recommend some kind of investment account. Let's take a look at our investment options, starting with the safest. The most secure, low-risk option is a basic term deposit, starting with a minimum deposit of $1,000. Interest is calculated daily, but you can choose whether to have it paid out monthly, quarterly, or at maturity. What we recommend, if you really want to see money grow, is having interest compounded quarterly. You'll only get access to your funds when your term deposit matures, so be sure to think carefully about the amount of time before you lock it away. It could be anything from six months to five years. Bonds are generally a longer commitment, but they may bring better rewards in the future. There is a minimum deposit of $5,000 and interest is calculated daily. You may choose to have interest compounded quarterly, or paid out quarterly. And, of course, you'll have access to your money when your bond reaches maturity. Looking really long-term, there is our retirement fund, which is, of course, a savings plan for retirement. There is no minimum deposit, but the good news is that you can choose to contribute a certain percentage of your income before tax is paid on it. As for interest, well, you choose a particular type of fund which has a different level of return depending on the level of risk. And access? Well, not before you turn 60 years old. As I said, it's a retirement scheme. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
Now turns to part three. Part three. You will hear a conversation between two students and their professor, who is asking them to organize a panel discussion for an upcoming conference. First, you have some time to look at questions twenty-one to twenty-three. Listen carefully and answer questions twenty-one to twenty-three. Come in and sit down, Louise Stewart. I suppose you're wondering why I've asked you both to come here today. Well, we've heard rumours. Forget the rumours. I'll get straight down to business. You know that I'm organising a conference on seventeenth-century English literature. Yes, but. Well, I've arranged for three keynote speakers, and I've invited twenty-five panelists so that we can have five panel discussions. And I want you two to organise one of the panel discussions. But we haven't done that before. Is it like a team presentation? No, the purpose is quite different. In a team presentation, the group presents agreed-upon views, as you have both done at the end of a group project. Yes. Well. In a panel discussion, the purpose is to put forward different views. We want to expose the audience to several different viewpoints at the same session. It can help the audience evaluate their own positions regarding specific issues, and if it's well conducted, it's usually more interesting than a single speaker forum. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions twenty-four to thirty. Now listen and answer questions twenty-four to thirty. And what exactly do we have to do? Well, you'll take the role of leader or moderator and assistant. Is that like the role of chairman? Yes, that's it. Sounds daunting. Not at all. I've already done a great deal of the preparation myself. Let me run through the procedure with you. I've singled out an issue that will entail quite some conflict of opinion. I've selected panelists who are well informed and will probably have contradictory points of view. That's very important, you know. Actually, I feel a bit nervous. How many panelists will there be? Well, I've invited five panelists for each panel because that's probably the maximum number that an inexperienced moderator can handle. But don't worry. I always invite more than we need because you can be sure someone won't be able to make it. So you'll probably just end up with four, which is a very manageable number. Oh, I see. And I've chosen a moderator. That's you, by the way. Ah, but Stuart will help, right? Yes. I'll get onto timekeeping and whatnot shortly. That's where an assistant is indispensable. But what procedure do we follow to conduct the panel discussion? Don't worry. I was just about to say. I've also settled on the format. What is it? There are various formats that can be followed, but I've always found this one to be very effective. Yes. Okay. Make some notes on these guidelines as I run through them, and ask me questions about anything you don't understand. We're ready. Firstly, the moderator introduces the topic and the panelists. But we don't know who the panelists are. Don't worry. I've prepared a short biographical introduction for each one of them, and I'll give you that information tomorrow. Oh, good. Next, the panelists are given a set amount of time to present their views on the topic. I'd say about two minutes each should be sufficient. Now, this is where Stuart's timekeeping is going to be important. 
You have to keep to the schedule all the way through because the lecture room has only been booked for an hour. How do I indicate when the time is up? You stand off to one side of the panel, either with your back to the audience or hidden from the audience, but in full view of the panel and moderator. You have a digital clock or timer, and you hold up the appropriate number of fingers to give the number of minutes. When the time is up, you make a cutting gesture with your hand. Ah, but what if the panelists keep talking? Then that's your job to politely intervene and move on to the next segment, which is the discussion itself. Panelists discuss, ask questions, and react to the opinions of other panel members. This, of course, is their primary function and should occupy about sixty percent of the allotted time. Stuart will watch the time, right? Yes, because you'll be making brief notes. Why? Well, when the time's up. The moderator shuts down the debate and provides a summary of the discussion. Oh, and then it's over. Well, no. The secondary function of the panel is to answer questions from the audience, and that should take up the remaining fifteen to twenty minutes. It's the leader's role to recognise appropriate questions and reject those not related to the subject. During the question period, you must maintain strict control. And this will most likely be the toughest part of the whole job. Oh dear! Stuart will of course help you here by ensuring that as many people as possible have a chance to ask their questions, and that no one member of the audience tries to dominate. With about five minutes to go, he'll announce that there's time for only a couple more questions. Then announce last question. And then it's over. Not quite. You still have to acknowledge the involvement of the panelists. And invite the audience to thank them with a round of applause. Should I clap too? Yes, you should both take part in the applause. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part four. Part four. You will hear a talk on hydroelectric power. First, you have some time to look at questions thirty-one to forty. Listen carefully and answer questions thirty-one to forty. Welcome to our series on renewable resources. The topic today is hydropower. As you most probably know, hydro means water, so we are talking about using water to generate electricity. Of course, there are many ways to generate electricity, but hydropower is important to the community. Firstly and obviously, because it's renewable, the Earth's hydrologic cycle of constant evaporation and transpiration provides a continual supply of water from rainfall and snowmelt. The second point to consider is its efficiency. Hydropower plants are able to convert approximately ninety percent of the energy from the falling water into electric energy, whereas many fossil-fueled plants. Lose more than half of the energy content of their fuel by way of waste heat and gases. For this reason, they are very efficient. Hydropower is also clean. It doesn't emit harmful gases that contribute to air pollution, acid rain, and global warming. No trucks, trains, or pipelines are needed to bring fuel to the site, and there's no noise pollution either. Furthermore, hydropower plant machinery. Is fairly simple and runs at slow speeds, which makes it reliable and durable. And hydropower units are flexible also; they have the ability to start quickly 
and adjust rapidly to changes in demand for electricity, thus enabling them to meet peak loads. But this also allows them to serve as reserve capacity and bring more stability to the power system overall. The dams that provide hydroelectric power also have other uses, such as navigation, flood damage reduction, water supply, recreation, irrigation, and low flow augmentation. But it's not the purpose of this talk to go into those details. How do the hydropower plants work? Well, a dam is built across a river, which captures water to form a reservoir and raises the water level to create head. Think of head as the vertical distance that the water falls as it passes through the dam. In other words, the difference in water level between the reservoir behind the dam and the river below. Water from the reservoir flows through an intake gate into a penstock. This is a kind of narrow channel which leads to the turbine below. The force of the water causes the turbine to rotate rapidly, which in turn drives the generator to spin and produce electricity. The electricity is carried the long distances from the powerhouse to substations on the outskirts of cities via power lines. Can you build a hydropower unit on any river? Well, no. Just having water in a river isn't enough. A good dam site must have enough stream flow as well as enough head. A fast-flowing river on the plains is probably not suitable because a dam couldn't be built high enough to provide the head needed for efficient production of electricity. On the other hand, dams in arid high country. May have plenty of head, but insufficient stream flow. The perfect spot for a hydropower plant is where the right combination of stream flow and head exists. What about the environment? Surely the construction of large dams has an environmental impact. Well, yes, it does. Certainly, dams and reservoirs are built to improve the lives of people living in towns, farming communities, and cities. But there must be a balance between development and preserving the natural environment. Needless to say, the natural river environment is changed, which leads to changes in river ecology and aquatic habitat. Sometimes, for example, dissolved oxygen levels below dams get so low in summer that there is a negative impact on aquatic life. These levels can be improved, however, by using special Aerating turbines and/or injecting oxygen directly into the stream flow. In order to protect and improve the habitat for endangered and other species of birds, fish, and water life, there needs to be a thorough review of operating plans to see if a better balance can be achieved. Hydropower plant design and operation must not only meet the needs of consumers for electricity, but work hand in hand. With agencies whose concern is for the fish and wildlife, water quality, and water supply. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.